This is Jeff Ritter with Worldly Experiences here with Jennifer Tober uh, for a second time uh, to talk about all kinds of things with, uh, I think, nonprofits and acting and theater and uh, how to survive in the world with, in, a, in a world of artistic and talent uh, is really the key things that we're in, I'm interested in. I think people we need to want to know about. Uh, if you're a young person and you're You've got this itch to be in talent, you'd be in acting and theater and movies, you know. I'll do anything. I want to sing, I want to dance. Is it just give up now, kid? Go learn computers and uh and be realistic. Or is there is there hope? What do you think? No, oh, yes, yes. Do you follow the do the arts, follow your passion, do the arts. I mean, I I remember um the last interview we talked about um you know how we were all saying, I think we were all artists on the call and um, we were saying, you know, if you can do something else, do it. But I think artists can't, well, they can do other things, of course, but you, you, if you're an artist, you must pursue your art yeah. through good times and bad, right? And I, and I think, um, and this is also the way we think about it in the philosophy of yoga too. I'm also a yoga instructor. Um, is that it's a it's a lifelong process. It's a calling. It's a lifelong calling. So yes, <laughs> gra go out and grab art by the can I say balls horns maybe I'll say and, uh, and and pursue your passion. But I also think that you know Jeff just a second ago you and I were talking about you know trying to be an artist in a smaller market like Pittsburgh, which is a lovely city you know and it's it's a it's a great town but it's it can be, uh, it can have a finite market in terms of, um, you know, just art artistic, whether it's theaters or, uh, you know, any, any um, art, just because it's a smaller population. And I think, you know, there are certainly more opportunities of all kinds and bigger markets. I mean, I moved here from New York City where it wasn't always, um, you know, it was certainly was not a glamorous life. It was a, it was a hard life, but it was, uh, I worked a lot and there's just, there's a lot of work and there's a lot of work kind of on every level. And, you know, I'm, I'm a trained stage, a classical, a classically trained actor, but in New York, you know, that we did, uh, I, I did commercials and film and Saturday Night Live and voiceovers and, more voiceovers and regional theater and Shakespeare in Central Park and, you know, put together our own Shakespeare. And th there was always something going on. Um, and so I think if you're really passionate about it, you might want to, um, you know, put yourself into a bigger market. I liked being a small fish in a big pond, <laughs> I, but that, that suited me, you know, I, I, like, uh, I like New York City. I like a real big yeah. um, population, but, and I also encourage people to go into not only um, creating art, but also, um, you know, changing our political system in the way that we fund art. You know, um, a lot of small arts organizations and even big arts organizations spend so much time writing grants and trying to get funding, you know, and recently, because of COVID, that funding pool has been shrinking, you know, because our, our our resources are going to um, you know, emergency services, feeding people and keeping um, people afloat and paying rent. Um, and so it's it, the squeeze is kind of on right now. And I also encourage people to go into arts administration and um, a political life as well to change, you know, the the way that we federally fund or do not federally fund enough um, arts. But yes, I think if you have a passion for especially theater, go for it. It's a very rewarding life. <laughs> you mentioned arts administration. I mean, there's a lot of schools that are, have degree programs in that now. Is that is that a worthy degree? I mean, should you need to get a degree in that, or can you just say, "Hey, I'd like to work in an arts organization, be around the arts"? Uh, it gives me a good feeling to be a part of promoting and and uh, work for something I believe in. What I'm going to do, you know, spreadsheets and accounting and uh, publicity and marketing. Do you really need to get a degree in it? Well, I, uh, let's see, that's a really good question. I mean, I, my personal experience, even with Pittsburgh Shakespeare in the Parks, uh, which, uh, you know, I founded in 2005, my experience is more on the artistic side. And so I kind of had to, to learn how, how do you make a, a spreadsheet or how do you make a budget or um, how, what is it to write a grant, you know, and I, I think as long as you're, 
you're telling the story of the organization. As long as you're tell accurately representing the narrative and telling the narrative, uh, I, I think it doesn't matter how you get that experience, but you do need to uh, balance the books <laughs> and you, you do need to file, you know, your taxes and you do need to pay your e-tides, if anybody knows what I'm talking about. The very, you know, kind of unfun, un, you know, poetic administrivia <laughs> of organizations. Yeah. That's very important um, because, you, you know, you need to you need to operate in the black and you need to be above board. You need to be able to. But uh, right now, arts organizations are struggling. It is a tough time for all of them. It is performances time. and live performances. And uh, yeah. some are innovating, right? I mean, we are see, going to see and already are seeing uh, arts of all kinds, from music to theater, dance and, and uh, uh, opera even and uh, concerts uh, adapting to the Zoom and uh, online world. Uh, uh, is that a, is that going to be a key thing that's going to change the way arts works in the future? Are they going to are some of these things going to stick and say, hey, you know, this is actually better? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I know that you know there are so many more people just working from home in every sector. Well, unless you have a service job or a medical job where you really can't work from home. Um, but I, I mean, and for us, for example, you know thank goodness for Zoom and for things like live. We're streaming right now, right, on Facebook uh, and YouTube because we were able um, just a couple weeks ago to stream Cymbeline, um, which was our 2020 fall production. And we were not allowed to um, meet in person and to perform. And in fact, Broadway is going to be closed through June 2020, and that's really hurting uh, a lot of people, but we we were able to do a performance online and you can see I kind of have this background behind me um, that our designer Lisa Liebring put together. Um, we had these, these puppets. I mean, these were all things, you know, um, since we couldn't do things like fight scenes or dance scenes, really, do we really want to try to do a fight scene with swords in my dining room? You know, we were so limited in terms of not being able to be together. So we, we created these alternative things, puppets and um, some dream sequences that we were able to pre-tape. And then um, we had our videographer, Ryan Bergman, splice those into the performance. So in some ways, although we were not able to perform in the Pittsburgh city parks like we do, we were forced to get creative with these different things, you know, this act toy that shows different set places, different settings. So maybe, I mean, I, I think that we certainly should not shun technology and for now it's keeping us safe. Yeah. You know, and something where some props were passed between people. Oh, Zoom windows. That's a really planning to do yeah, that. Um, let's see, do I, of course I don't have anything right here, but let's say, um, you know, this was, I was going to pass this along. And so I would say, you know, um, I'm husband, I'm, I'm being banished from the kingdom. I'm going to miss you forever here. You know, this didn't really happen, but here's an example. Take my crown and wear it. And then I would pass it. And then the actress on the other side, uh, the yeah. other computer would take it. And then, yeah. so our designer made two or three sets of everything. Um, well, this may be creating a new uh, category of uh, artistic director, Zoom artistic director, Zoom director for plays or for, <laughs> and uh, we, we, may not, we may not use this term Zoom, maybe online, something yeah. else. Yeah, virtual. It, it to be associated with just one company, but uh, uh, taking a vision of how this can be a new format for artistic uh, communication that brings out new possibilities. Yes. Well, I mean, it's certainly, you know, it certainly is, uh, is keeping us safe right now. Hi, Kate. <laughs> Maybe I wasn't supposed to say okay. that. I just saw Kate. Hi. Um, you know, it, it was either um, not perform at all. Yeah. Or, um, you know, in the beginning, we thought, oh, no, we're going to have to do it online. It's going to suck. And it was actually a great experience, I think, for a lot of us. And, you know, as a performer, 
uh, I'll talk about the audience as well, but as a performer, I thought, oh, it's going to feel dead. You know, it's, I can't move around. I'm a very physical hyper, you know, I like to ham it up type actor, which I, I, I still did even on Zoom. And as you can <laughs> watch that. I'll be the first to admit. Um, I like a lot of drama, but I thought, oh, it's going to, I'm not going to feel any connection with the other actors. And yeah. some of us still have never met in person. Oh. And we would just hang out and like, <laughs> you know, yeah. you see everybody's photos and and gaze at each other yeah. Yeah. and have happy hours and drink and toast and chat with the audience and do sonnets and and you know and and then so that was really nice because we we still felt this connection so it is possible to you know to to learn and to grow and to have an emotional exchange yeah. which I, I guess I don't know why I felt like that would be deadened. But at the end of Cymbeline, it's kind of emotional. Everybody kind of comes back together after this very tumultuous um, journey of families being ripped apart and um, just all kinds of, of mistrust and kind of abuse almost from um, mostly from King Cymbeline, but kind of in every aspect of this of this dysfunctional family. And in the end, everybody's the, the bad people are kind of killed off and everybody is reunited and the family is brought back together. And I would find myself crying, you know, um, when it's revealed that my character Imogen has these two long lost brothers. And, um, you know, when they first meet, they don't know they're related. They, they all kind of have this, they can't say why, but they love each other, you know? And it's like this, this thing of, twins being separated at birth and coming back together you know and I would just find myself crying at the end of every performance and I thought what's wrong with me am I a menopausal here uh, you know why but it, it really touched me and I I I think I was surprised by that I, I thought it would be a more removed experience um and on the upside you know everybody's safe and there's no bugs you don't have to use mosquito spray uh, yeah. you know you can have your snacks here and you know uh, well, there's yeah. a tv show we saw just by chance it turned on there was there were nine boxes on tv and it was a family w waiting for somebody or they were talking it was a, it's a sitcom it's a regular tv uh, sitcom on network television that that's the whole show yeah i, I mean yeah so if we're smart we'll all start doing zoom stuff right now like write your scripts for zoom right yeah, so writing scripts for new New types of TV shows or movies or shorts or even uh, even documentaries. Uh, or new or new formats are going to come up, and uh, I think a lot of them will be uh, will be around forever. And it is a great time for collaboration. Yeah. Uh, you collaborate. You're collaborating with people right now. So am I. Uh, we all have some time we didn't have before because we don't have commuting, we don't have driving, we don't have uh, movies to go to and things like Job. that. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, we have the tools for collaboration. So it is a great time for young people or anybody if they have an idea. Say, you know, why why doesn't this exist? How can can I do this? You can find people using Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, all those things. Find collaborators. Some are going to be great, and some are going to be terrible, and some will disappear, and some will stay around. But it is a good time to to do something new like that. And um, yeah. uh, we're gonna, I think, we'll find it. We'll say in five or ten years, oh, that came from the pandemic era. Right. That's when that started. Uh, yeah, I had a year to work on it. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it, to think ahead to the future? And I, I always think about this and wonder how we'll look back and what will it be in hindsight right i mean it, it's uh yeah and and i think you know you've touched upon something that's really important it's about connection whether you're um you know celebrating your your grandmother's birthday via zoom or um a wedding or whatever or doing a show you know doing music it's it's about staying connected and i you know that is what art does at its at its deepest i think is human connection and it's very important to keep that up let's get to some yeah. i guess nitty-gritty items for some people just talking about a job or getting into a job or getting a job you've done this quite a bit you you know how to you know a lot of the ins and outs oh. of, of how to do this what is it about inter being in an interview or writing the right letter or the email or dressing right or sitting the right way i mean it's kind of an acting job right uh, uh yeah exceeding at something like that. What do you do? What do you recommend for somebody who's nervous, hasn't done it before, is scared, 
feels insecure about it. It may be a great talent and a great energy and ability to do the job, but just hasn't been able to communicate to people, I'm the right person for your, for your organization. Um, that's a great question. So you're talking about like a sit down interview, not an audition necessarily. Uh, yeah, any kind of any interview that's going to be, it's going to be online now, right? Yeah, right. It's going to be online. Um, I think, um, you know, I think the same rules kind of apply, uh, be prepared. I think that's the most important thing, you know, be prepared and be honest, um, know yourself, uh, in, even in, in theater, I had, a um, a teacher who said, who said to us, before you go into the audition, read your resume, reread it, <laughs> you know, bring yourself, you know what you can do, focus it, make sure that you're representing yourself truthfully. Uh -huh. Don't lie on your resume, you know, be honest about yourself and your abilities and just tell the story, tell your narrative. And also, you know, know the company or the organization that you're applying for know what they do, check them out on social media. Um, I even go as far as to, you know, um, I'm not saying I stalk people, but I'm saying I will read people's resumes to yeah. see, you know, to see what they, what, what's their philosophy. And I, I think it's important um, to feel confident about yourself and to, to really, to think about, be prepared, but then think about what do I have uh, what talents and what unique skills do I have that I can bring and just tell that story, uh, you know, very easily. It doesn't always go well, you know, yeah. we're not always a good fit or the company may not be a good fit. I mean, I've certainly worked in all, you know, different types of sectors where it just didn't, it just didn't work. You know, <laughs> I think we all have those, That's we true. all have those experiences where it, something wasn't a good fit and it, it just didn't work out. And, you know, if that's in the arts or in business or wherever. Yeah. Um, and I think it's also very important to, you know, I, I'm, I'm teaching this movement class right now at, at point, stage movement for Point Park students, for um, fresh people. And it's, it's really great because, you know, it's really about the mind body connection, you know, and you can't, you can't separate that, you know, you, how you feel and, and uh, what you're thinking and it's all connected. And so a lot of times I find it very interesting that we're talking about the physical um, and this is authentic movement. It's not dance or anything. It's how you can, can free yourself to move in the most optimal and the, the best way that you can on stage, right? So it's about kind of getting in touch with your own body and building a vocabulary and building strength and also relaxation. And so much of it is about refining and kind of um, developing your mental state as well, you know, not letting negative thoughts take over, but also not trying to clear the mind. And I think that's really helpful for an interview. We all have negative thoughts that come in yeah. Right? Yeah. when we get nervous. That's the first thing that happens. And uh, instead of saying, no, I must clear my mind and be peaceful, right? Which is setting yourself up for failure, accepting those negative thoughts. Yeah. You know, it's the good and the bad, and I am where I am right now, and I'm going to present myself in this interview or this audition the best I can. Now, it's also helpful, I think, to, I mean, for an audition where you're up on stage or singing or doing Shakespeare or whatever, or moving around, you have to be physically warmed up and vocally warmed up. And I think that's also helpful for a sit down or even a Zoom interview, you yeah. know? Um, make sure you eat and have coffee, but not too much coffee. Make sure you have water make sure that you breathe and make sure that you, you know, you, you warm up in some way that you treat yourself well so that yeah. you are in a, you're in a, a good kind of headspace to do it. A lot of good advice. <laughs> hard to, hard to, to, hard to do, you know, even though you, you know it, it's still yeah. hard to put it to effect. Um, sometimes uh, we get into the flow, right? Like yeah. sometimes we flow and it works or whether we're shooting baskets or um, I love basketball. So I love to pretend like I can play basketball even though I'm terrible. And sometimes you just get into the flow and sometimes it works. And then other days you just can't, you know, you can't, you can't hit it. So. And what about, actual? I mean, I, I don't know if you've had, had as many as I've had, I've had a few just the uh, jobs that were, you know, not jobs I wasn't, knew I wasn't going to stay at, uh, jobs that were temporary, jobs that were uh, physical. Uh, you have to move quickly. You have to get things done. You have customers. You have 
you know, something, all those different kinds of things. And uh, you've had a few of those, I imagine, too. Uh, uh, service jobs, uh, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you're, if you're yeah. doing that to survive, which a lot of people are, are probably doing now, you know, they, they it's not their life's goal, but you got to right. you got to take a job of some kind. You need to make some money. Sure. And he, how do you get through something like that? Well, I think, you know, all work is honorable if you're if you're doing it from in yoga, we say, um, <laughs> this sounds goofy, but it's tr it really helps me. Um, a cheerful disposition and a servant heart, right? So yeah. if you approach anything, I mean, mm -hmm. sometimes let's face it, there are crappy jobs <laughs> that we do. And I, we've all been in situations with a, a boss who was not nice or, right? Or it just, I mean, I certainly, when I was in New York, took on like a temp job or something, and I just could not do it, like at a law firm or something. And they had to let me go. I just, I was not, I couldn't do what they wanted me to do, right? <laughs> and those happen, and you lick your wounds, you yeah. know, you you get fired. Everybody has. Um, one of my friends, uh, my friend Glenn Fleschler, in New, in um, who's based out of New York. He told me about this. Uh, it's like famous famous people doing this night of like a time when you were fired from something, you know. And it's just really humbling because everybody has had those experiences. I think, right? Yep. There's, it, it's just not a good match, and that's okay. But I think it, it's we know that in this country, you know, we don't have patrons like they do in in Italy. You know, I have a friend here who's a a sculptor, and he is a patron in Italy who pays his bills and he can he devotes his time to sculpting it's amazing i don't have that so <laughs> you know most of us don't in the united states our economy is not set up with art to be at the top of the kind of you know the financial hierarchy and so many artists do other jobs and i i think it's it's honorable work and i i think if you approach it like you know whether you're doing you're on Broadway or you're washing dishes or you're walking dogs. I mean, it's, it's all important. And oh. I, I think that we should, um, you know, if we, if we approach it with a, a servant heart and a cheerful disposition and a sense of we're, you know, doing something for someone, then I think it's all important. It can be the inspiration to get yourself to a higher level, more <laughs> training education or more uh, uh, opportunities, find more opportunities for yourself. And you could certainly at this at the time you're doing it say this isn't forever. Right. Uh, I'm not doing. I hope it's not forever. <laughs> and um, uh, I'm working on a, on this to be something. It builds a, it builds a, you up, builds your character, everything. Yeah. And I've had I've been pretty lucky. I mean, I've had lots of kind of great day jobs. Well, I mean, I've taught English as a second language for a long time. Although that. It seems like Jeff, you and I were kind of joking about this earlier. All of the things I do are kind of drying up right now during yeah. COVID because they're all in person, right? Teaching yoga, teaching ESL, but teaching international students for me kind of started as a J job, but it really has become a second career for me. And I, I love it. And teaching, well, you know, cause you're a teacher as well. Teaching is amazing and rewarding. Yeah. And so yeah. another great calling. It is. It is. And I'm sure lots of people are thinking about it now and saying, schools, yeah. what's going to happen to schools in the future? Are we going to have uh, regular classes and teachers? Are going to, is it going to come back the way it was? Or are we going to adapt it to something new? And yeah. we'll be probably some combination, but teachers are adapting to online teaching. They're figuring yeah. it out, using it and doing it. And uh, uh, congratulations <laughs> to them. They have to do it. You'll do it. It'll get <laughs> Uh, that's the way they are. It can um, be hard, yeah. yeah. So we, I think uh, I've certainly been teaching where just the thing I can't share the screen, or the thing won't load, or everybody freezes. Right? I mean, that happens quite a bit. There are lots of funny skits. Uh, Let's talk about acting a little more. Uh, uh, how early did you decide you wanted to be an actor? Did acting bug hit you, or did you start with it something else and get into it? What's the first thing you remember? No, I mean, I, it's interesting because when I was a little kid, I wanted to be like a farmer. You know, I love to like play outside and dig in the dirt and move rocks around. I loved moving rocks. And um, that was kind of my earliest thing that I wanted to do. And um, I guess it was, this is not a very glamorous story, but I, I guess it wasn't really until college um, okay. that I, I thought I, I 
that even though I started majoring in social work, I thought, I think I want to do theater. Because <laughs> um, I didn't come from a, a performing family, although I do have one aunt who's an, an opera singer and an opera, a music professor. Um, but I didn't grow up with her. And I didn't really have that much, much exposure where I grew up in the suburbs of Philly to that much um, performance, only kind of in high school. Uh -huh. And uh, I guess it was in college. I just thought I really want to do this. And I auditioned and I got cast, of course, as an old lady um, in the 5th of July as Sally. I think Aunt Sally, who I had to wear like a wig and the age makeup. And that's been a recurring theme, playing old people or men for me. Uh -huh. Um, not sure why. And uh, yeah, so I think it was in college and I just, um, I took kind of a, a, yeah, I wasn't like a child prodigy or anything. I mean, I used to do, uh, when I was little, I used to entertain my little brother and stuff by um, running around and yeah. goofing around. And I used to do my mod imitation for my I parents. Yeah, yeah. Arthur and Ginger. Uh -huh. So anyway, yeah, but um, it was a, it was a, not that exciting of a story. <laughs> I just, uh, I auditioned in college and started getting roles and switched my major and then got my master's degree and just kept going. And I also really, uh, at Temple University as an undergrad, I, I became really enamored of Shakespeare and the Royal Shakespeare Company. And I just, I really started to love Shakespeare. Oh, you, you had exposure to it earlier, but it didn't, didn't hit you until later. Yeah, not really. Yeah. yeah, that's funny. That's interesting. Maybe you had a really good teacher for Shakespeare in college. Yeah, we, we didn't. You know, it's funny. We didn't even really have Shakespeare, uh, per se. We uh -huh. just kind of had acting. And yeah, I don't think we did. It's interesting. Yeah. Uh, but I we, we certainly worked on Shakespeare monologues and Shakespeare scenes. And I, you know, we, we were um, the Temple Library, I guess, had these. They must have had these or somebody had these recordings of like the BBC, you know, in the 1980s doing all these Shakespeare plays. Right. And um, I just thought it was, it was so great to see Shakespeare right. done so well. I thought that's what I want to do. Uh -huh. I want to do Shakespeare. <laughs> oh, this is usually a, cool. like, uh, yeah. an event or a series of events or a community or a teacher that gets somebody like you to the point where you, where you decide to pursue something so, uh, not necessarily specialized, but so uh, unique, really, that most people don't even do. Yeah, and Temple University, when I was an undergraduate there, it had a really great MFA program, so Masters of Fine Arts, and I remember being, a, you know, like an undergraduate and watching the um, the Masters, the graduate students, and thinking, like, I hope someday, you know, yeah. I'll be as good as them. And they yeah. got all dressed up for their showcase and the girls wore these like sequin dresses. And I thought, yeah. oh, I want to do, you know, I was just, and then I remember in New York at one of my first professional auditions, I ran into one of the previous yeah. graduate students and I, I couldn't believe that I was actually at an audition with her. And I, I thought like, oh no, she's so, I, I can't, this can't be happening. She's so much better than me. And I, she came over to me and talked to me and I remember I was speechless. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> but yeah, so that had a, bit, a big effect on me seeing the, the graduate students yeah. actually had kind of forgotten about that. They just seemed so amazing to mm -hmm. me, you know, as a lowly undergraduate, I aspired to be like them, so. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> when you do things, when you do such a variety of things like uh, in theater and movies and music and, and uh, commercials. Did you have to know a lot of technical things about each one of these uh, different kind of uh, media? Did you have to know a lot about it? That's a really good question. Um, is this a trick question? Because I know you're a film expert. Oh, okay. Um, uh, let's see. Okay. I, I, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> not really. I mean, I, I think, you know, if you if you're trained as, you know, we call it like classically trained actor, we learn voice and speech for the stage and we learn um how to speak class you know in a in a in a good dialect and things like that and how to project and how to move and fill the space mm -hmm. and then sometimes you know when you after you've had that training and you're very earnest and you go to on camera auditions they say like too loud yeah yeah so i always get that um uh -huh. okay. donna belajack here casting director is great at telling me like do it again uh -huh. stop acting you know um or you, you're too loud or you're too too animated um and i remember one time i had an audition um 
I booked this I booked this job and I had to use a teleprompter and I had I had never used a teleprompter mm -hmm. so I very quickly went to like paid somebody 50 bucks or whatever in New York City to go to her apartment and learn how to use a teleprompter which is just reading words across the screen I mean it, it you know it wasn't anything that in your head to read the words yeah they were reading the words <laughs> you know um but things like that happen and I think they happen in careers or you know first time in the at an audition with a voiceover you know you're right on the mic and it's popping and they say well you know uh, but those are all learnable things. And I, I think it's really helpful to take those on-camera classes. You know, yeah. we have some great ones in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. It kind of helps you along. Everybody's, once you're in for a job, they're going to give you the tips you need for the tech stuff. It's not going yeah. to be, yeah, yeah, that's good. Right. And it's super fun to work on. You know, in New York, I worked on, and in Pittsburgh too, a couple of films. And films are really fascinating just because, there's so much going on, you know, yeah. and you realize that as an actor, you're just a very, very small part of it. And mm -hmm. that everybody else is probably doing a lot more work than you are, you know. Um, that's really fascinating um, just to, you know, see the way that the lights have to be adjusted for each yeah. actor and the stand-ins the stand -ins and they have to get the room tone. And it, it's just, there's, and, and it's, I don't know that much about it, you know, because I'm, approaching it from the performance side, but those experiences were really helpful to learn about. There's so much that goes into productions that, you know, that you may not know about if you are uh, a performer. Now in almost any town, I know Pittsburgh has it, but in probably in almost any town, there's at least some kind of theatrical agent that works for both the music, I'm not music, movies or TV or yeah. uh, uh, films that are being shot nearby. I mean, Films can be shot anywhere now. I mean, yeah, Netflix is all over the country. They like Pittsburgh, but they're in lots of other cities too. Uh, can a person who feels like they're ready to be an actor just go to an agent and say, "I'd like to, I'd like you to represent me. I want to get some acting jobs." Yeah, well, there in Pittsburgh, there are two casting directors, really, um, Nancy Mosser and Donna Belajack, and they're both amazing women and just really great, and they really know their stuff. Um, and I believe you might have to check their websites, but I, I believe they have open calls. Okay. Um, and there are really two agencies in Pittsburgh, the Talent Group and Doherty. And you can also check their websites. They have open calls still. I don't know what's happening with COVID. Um, I know not that much stuff is happening right now, but you can check out their websites and go to an open call. Usually you take some kind of headshot um, and resume. And if you're just starting out, you can have just a nice, photo of yourself um yeah. a lot of this is done digitally now anyway um yeah. you can type up a resume of you know what you've done and your skills and things like that and it's easy to find sample um you know theater and film resumes online mm -hmm. um and then you go and usually um they have open calls maybe once or twice a month they might give you some copy to read and copy is like might be a commercial or it might be a short um, voiceover or something like that. And they might just ask you to read it. Yeah. And, um, that's a good way to start. Or you can take classes. You know, there's lots of good on camera classes. Um, there are good um, acting classes at various there's, places. So and yeah. you can come to me. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to. And um, and you can always start your own thing. Just start it with on your, with your friends on YouTube. Make your own videos and, uh, right. and uh, do the best you can and get noticed. That's a lot of people, young people are trying to do. I mean, that's the advice we give them for film and video: is don't wait for somebody to right. tell you what to do. Make, you want to make something, go make it. If it's not uh, uh, yeah. perfect, perfect Hollywood quality, everybody knows you're not in Hollywood. It, they'll accept it if you if it's interesting and people want to people want to watch that most anything nowadays. Twitch is a new channel. You ever look at Twitch? Yeah, uh, my 13 year old son kind of turned me on to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything's on there now, too. That's not just uh, video games, there's all kinds of other things that people are watching, other people doing teaching going on on Twitch. There's political commentary. I mean, anything, anything these days. Pretty news? No, I hope not. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Real That's news. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. now, you said that uh, you started the Shakespeare. Uh, in the parks organization in 2005. 
2005, yeah. That's pretty good to have an organization that lasts this long uh, these days without uh, going under. With uh, You've had a pretty good run of uh, some decent um, financing, grants, underwriting, different kinds of things to support you, or has it just always been by the skin of your teeth? Yeah, um, it, it, you know, it's, it's kind of ebbed and flowed. I mean, when we started out, when I started out, it was just me and I had just moved to Pittsburgh and I was spending a lot of time in Frick Park and I thought, I was only teaching part-time at CMU and I didn't have kids yet. And I thought, I am going to do a Shakespeare play out here. <laughs> so it was November that first year. And, you know, we just passed the hat and got audience donations and I divvied up the cash and gave it to the cast. Uh -huh. um, and I thought, okay, I'm going to do this again next year. And then slowly, you know, there are some people on the board now that were, I met back in 2005, you know, very loyal. Um, and we're a, we're a working board. Um, and so basically we need a huge endowment. So if anybody out there listening to this loves Shakespeare and would like to support us, we could, um, we'll get in touch with me. But yeah, I mean, we, and we provide free Shakespeare. So we are dependent on donations, okay. um, audience donations when we're in the parks um, or, you know, PayPal online. And then we also have grant funding. We have foundation funding. And that yeah. changes according to the, you know, the financial climate. Um, the last couple of months have been, have been hard. Um, just because again, a lot of the, the kind of, I guess the extra funding has been re-diverted to emergency services. Um, you had to start the um, nonprofit as, as a legal organization. That's right. We're a nonprofit. You can't for a grant or get a grant without that. You can't unless you unless you have a, a like a fiscal sponsor or you're part of an umbrella organization like uh, Fractured Atlas. There are many. Um, I think locally, New Sun Rising. Yeah. But right, <laughs> it's hard to um, you, you if you want to really fundraise and get money it's it's good to be a nonprofit unless you're in it to make a profit you know which uh, maybe might be the better route these days you know i don't i don't know well, there are there are organizations that have said it's easier to be a for profit organization and have a simple bookkeeping and and taxes and all those things a nonprofit gives you some opportunity to get grants but in the world where grants are getting so hard to get yeah you know what it's easier just to be paid for something and provide a product maybe yeah that's, that, that's a very tempting but then we we all, i always go back to our philosophy that we believe that art should be accessible to everybody and i just personally come from such a long tradition of um performing in shakespeare for free for people that that's very near and dear to my heart so but you're right it's um at a certain point you think well, we're putting you know this organization is putting so much energy into raising the funds that were, you know, we, we we wish we had more time just to create, yeah. just to create. So whenever somebody has an idea, I mean, we see all these constantly. See, oh, this young person's uh, resume. They started a nonprofit in eleventh grade, so they could raise money. <laughs> Hence in Nepal, you know. Uh, they, I love it. You necessarily need to start your own nonprofit if you have an idea and you want to get something accomplished. First thing you would do is, and you might have looked at this too, is what nonprofit already exists. That might be interested in doing this and i could work for them or start for them for free and they could be the organization of uh, umbrella organization that i'd work under you don't always have to start your own nonprofit, right. right no you don't and uh, that's right and oftentimes you there are a lot of nonprofit organizations in many sectors in this area yeah. of pennsylvania pittsburgh has and i forget what the percentage is so i won't even try to quote it but um yes it's 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 great to work for a nonprofit first or um, to, yeah, or to join, you know, to be part of an umbrella organization that has 501c3 as a, as a fiscal sponsor. Mm -hmm. And then you can operate, then you can apply for grants and things like mm -hmm. that. That's very common as well. But <clears throat> uh, let's see, uh, we, Pittsburgh Shakespeare in the Parks has been a 501c3, which is, um, you know, a dot .org, um, <clears throat> a not-for-profit for, hmm. I don't know how many years, I guess ten, 10 years, maybe yeah. now. I, I can't even remember. Um, without the official nonprofit status. 
What's that? You ran it for a while without the nonprofit status. We did, yes, because the organization was smaller then, um, and it was pretty much just me running it for a couple of years. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. But oh. either way, they're both the paperwork. Uh, <laughs> you have to do it if you're going to use if you're going to be involved with money. You have to have some kind of organization. Yes, and you have to pay your taxes. <laughs> you, you do yeah, have to do that. Think about. I mean. Shakespeare in the Park, um, you know, the museums we have, the uh, movies in the park, uh, the, the, the cultural district. I mean, Pittsburgh's got an amazing array of things to do in normal yeah. times. And we hope they're all going to come back and we'll have even more yes. <laughs> in the future. Uh, what is you, what have you seen about it, the way it contributes to life in Pittsburgh for people? What are you, what's your observation about how, it, how it's helped people here? Well, it's interesting because I, and I heard this when I first moved here, but I think like per capita, Pittsburgh has, I, I think like more equity houses or equity theaters than any other city in the country besides like New York City. I mean, like proportionally speaking. Besides, right? yeah. So there's just so, and that's theater, and I, but there's so much happening all the time here. I mean, mm -hmm. I live right near the Frick Art Museum, and that's amazing. And I mean, the the symphony and all of the all of the theaters, well, and of course the sports, right? We can't forget all the the yeah. football and baseball and everything. But there's so much to do in Pittsburgh. Uh, I mean, when my kids my kids are older now, but when we were they were little, we would go to the museum all the time. So much that. They would, you know, they would complain and say, "Not the museum again." And I would say, "Do you know how lucky you are <laughs> to have this amazing museum?" You know, and just so many things for kids and for people of all ages. And there's also so much cool stuff like, you know, like the the beer rides and you know the big pour and stuff at the Frick Environmental Center and uh, you know and and Quantum Theater is doing this really cool online theater right now. Mm -hmm. My son, Kenny Wood, my son is chiming in. Kenny yes, Wood. Kenny Wood. And I mean, it's just, it's a super fun town, you know? It's yeah, a, Kenny Wood was one of the attractions that, that we saw before we even moved here. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, was, and that was one thing we told people about. They have this old amusement park. It's like from 1950, 1960. Uh, and it was like stepping back in time. They've updated it since then, but yeah. it still has things in it that remind you of times before i remember right <laughs> i've are... never been there yeah yeah it's been... to sandcastle but not yeah well my dad grew up on the north side oh is that right uh, and yeah his street is no longer there his house was raised to make um the hospital okay Alabama general hospital but he grew up on the north side so for me going to that like i did a show at the um at the new hazlet a couple of years ago very nostalgic for me uh -huh. And walking around the north side which still retains a lot of its you can feel it you know a lot of its history so you didn't but you didn't grow up here no i grew up in philly yeah, okay in philly, yeah. and uh, so the uh the big city small city new york experience versus pittsburgh experience you were i guess you were in new york when you were younger how many years were you there i was there for about 11 years okay well that's pretty substantial uh and is it worth doing for a young person say make that make that big leap to new york and absolutely <laughs> i so i love new york it's just you know again it's like the feeling i get on the north side i feel this like ancestral nostalgia i don't know if i'm making it up but that's where my ancestors used to be you know they worked at the at the uh, heinz factory and everything and it was the same when i the first night that I spent in New York City, like when I like moved there, moved yeah. there, because I had been there for, sh for um, you know, th for, for work. I had, I worked with um, Hudson Valley Shakespeare Festival and like stayed with a friend and then went back to school and kind of went back and forth. But when I first moved there with my like two suitcases, I was staying, I don't even know where this was. I guess it was on the Upper East Side in my friend's basement apartment on the couch and like, that I could look up through the bars and the windows and yeah. like see what I thought was the moon, but it was actually a, a street light, you know, and then uh, all these trash cans out there and stuff. And I remember looking at what I thought was the moon and realized it was a street light. And I remember thinking, this is my home. <laughs> it's just, just so ridiculous. But, yeah. you know, it's like that feeling you get from somewhere. There's just something about New York City for me 
Yeah. Right. And it, it was it was more than just the work. It was there's something about the city that yeah. uh, who knows, you know, um, genetically I'm predisposed to I'm supposed to live there. I don't know. Um, but I think that's important too. You know, you you do need to you need to follow your passion. You need to follow your art, but you you have to be happy in your in the other aspects of life. So yes, what's that? And then coming to Pittsburgh, big change, big adaptation, very different kind of world. Yeah, it's different. I mean, I I think um, there there are so many good things. You know, I mean, I had kind not really grown up in Pittsburgh. I grew up in Philly, but. Uh, because my dad's family was here, we were here all the time. You know, we were here in the summers. And then I went to WVU for grad school, so West Virginia University. So I was quite familiar with the city. Um, I just, I have a love affair with New York City. I just, I loved it. Um, so for me, it was that, for me, I, you know, I love Pittsburgh and it's a great place to raise kids. And I think that is true. Um, I, it's just the you know the 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 pool of work is is smaller, um, and as my friend Sheila McKenna, who teaches at Point Park, says very eloquently, the talent pool in Pittsburgh is very deep, you know. So there are really good performers here, and there's just you know I think there's not enough work for us just because of it's just a numbers game, you know. Um, but Pittsburgh is wonderful. I mean, I have a yard here. In New York City, I had a fire escape with some <laughs> geraniums on it that I could crawl out on. You know, I mean, the it's just it's a wonderful place, and people are friendly, and it's yeah, I yeah. <laughs> I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. I always used to say to them, you know, you can always come back here, uh, but you're oh, only yeah. young and have a chance to try something new and try something that takes a lot of energy and takes a lot of, you know. A, a day in New York, walking through your whole day, you're, you're exhausted at the end, just getting from home to work and then this and that and everything you do. And Pittsburgh's easy. Yeah. It's a lot easier to, to survive here. And, um, uh, yeah. and but, you, but when you're young, you can have that, take that chance, take an adventure, whether it's New York, San Francisco, Chicago, Atlanta, wherever it is. Yeah. Well, I remember one time on my busiest day, I think in New York, I think I ro rode, rode the subway seven times. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs> like three auditions, you know, that's a busy day, but. But for the time for a young person starting out, they're really not sure what they want. Uh, and they're, they're finding they're in a town which doesn't have a lot of opportunity. Moving to a bigger city is one really good answer. There's a lot more jobs in a big city. There's a lot more people doing things that you might be interested in. You'll find out about things you've never found out about before. Exactly. Yeah. Or find people that are interested in the same things. You, there's only a few people here, but there's a thousand somewhere else. Sure. And uh, and uh, you can always come back here and, uh, and or come back wherever you live and uh, survive if you need to. But uh, you only have a chance to do that really when you're young, I think. Oh, I, I I think New York City would be a great place to retire. Well, that's right. Uh, <laughs> well, you, yeah. But I, but I also think, you know, if you're in Pittsburgh, there are so many arts organizations, wonderful arts organizations in every, you know, yeah. field of the arts. And they um, seem to have openings a lot. What's that? They always have openings in fundraising, certainly. They always have jobs. Yeah fundraising yeah or you could intern or you could just you know everybody's so approachable like you could go up to Carla Booz and say I hope this is okay Carla you know um hey I love quantum theater you know could I intern with you or alumni theater company or you know dreams of hope and say I love what you do can I can I shadow you or could I how can I help you and know? you can get some experience here with one of those organizations and then move you have a job you've had some experience yeah. on about two years fundraising yeah. can get you it can get you into a a big nonprofit in a city. Yeah. If you've got some even a two years experience here, they say, oh, we'd rather take somebody with experience than necessarily even with a master's degree in right. nonprofit management. Yeah. Have, don't forget the radio stations, you know, QED and yeah, um, yeah so, Wanna Pay, they're great. Yeah. yeah. A lot of things going on, a lot of, uh, we hope for the future, you know, we're going to have a continue to have improvements in the or opportunities to continue to exist. What's going to happen with Shakespeare in the Park next summer, this coming summer? Do you have any idea yet? We don't know. I, we hope, well, we usually, uh, you know, we traditionally rehearse in August 
and then perform in September. Um, so fingers crossed, we'll be able to be together in the parks. I mean, uh, for this past season, we had this like really intensive plan. We were gonna buy these platforms that we could haul around and raise the actors up high and have everybody mic'd and have audience sitting in pods. And then we got the, from Actors' Equity, the no, no can do. Um, it, was the parks, it was the parks department that said you can't perform the no performance. It was not the parks department. Actually, they weren't sure. Uh, the, the Pittsburgh City Parks Department said, we, we don't know yet, stay tuned. Um, North Park, because we, um, we were going to perform um, at the North Park Boathouse, which yard in the lawn there, which we were really excited about. Um, mm -hmm. So I love it up there. Um, that's administered by the county. They said, yeah, go ahead, sounds fine, as long yeah. as it's no more than 250 people. And we had it like mapped out, so we were gonna be spread apart, like 12 feet from yeah. each other. Um, it was Actors' Equity who said, you cannot. Really? Acting. Yeah, and um, yeah. There's, a, there's a dispute right now going on between Act Equity and SAG. Uh -huh. um, but, so you know, in the end, what's that? The union said, we don't want it to do that. We don't want you to do it to protect actors. Right. The union said you cannot. Huh. No, you can use non-equity actors, but we yeah. thought, well, we always, we've always followed equity guidelines yes. and I'm in the union, so I don't want to lose my, you know, union status. And we just yeah. thought, well, it's not, it's not fair to say, well, we can't use equity actors, but we can use non-union actors. Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> put them in harm's way. You know, if it's, so if it's a safety that? issue then. Yeah. So I don't know what we're going to do. Fingers crossed that we're going to be out in the parks. Right now we're kind of, um, we're healing from Cymbeline. We're not healing, but we're closing all the books and everything. And we're, um, I have two meetings after this, actually finance and fundraising. Uh -huh. Okay. <sighs> Okay. And uh, yeah, breathe, uh, get the numbers and breathe. And um, you know, we we're also thinking about doing a winter show. So because we can do it online, okay. and we're thinking of doing um, Love Labor's Lost, which is one of my favorite plays, which we did mm -hmm. in the parks about ten years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a very uh, Kenneth Branagh did an adaptation of it a couple of years ago. We did a movie. Um, Okay. But we, it's a, it, it's, it's very, it's a lot of um, witty repartee and um, it's very language heavy. And so we're, we're thinking of doing it in like a uh, beach setting, island tropicales theme, you know, like bikinis and Bermuda shorts and big hats and sunglasses and drinks. And, you know, uh, there's a masquerade party. So Mardi Gras masks, something in January and February to totally take our mind off of <laughs> what will be happening then, you know, COVID in the winter. So it's a so, great idea. Yeah. And you could use the uh, green screen backgrounds of beaches too. You, have you done anything with? I need somebody to give me a tutorial. I'm Is doing, oh, look at that. Yeah. I'm choosing them, Jeff. It just won't work. Those are my zombies after me. From the <laughs> Hopefully those are yeah. See, it kind of works. Part of your of the show, I think, if you have if you're if you have uh, backgrounds for that, right? I think we might do uh, uh you know again like set something up with PVC pipe or maybe a yeah. If you have real, real things, would be even cooler. If you real things are cool, yeah. Uh, set um, to work with you and put something in everybody's house, and you could yeah. Do something. yeah. Although but, virtual backgrounds are do something pretty cool now. to do. I'll have my 13 year old son look at this. Yeah, it's not working. I don't know why. That's funny. It's just changing something. Well, very good. Yeah. Wishing you luck <laughs> for the next upcoming season. Friendly for a winter show is a great idea. And uh, you've become Shakespeare in the Parks online uh, as well. And and uh, this can mean year round Shakespeare in the Park, not, yeah. just, not just in the park. That's right. We can do a winter show. Another adaptation due to COVID that may be uh, expanding what you do. So yeah, uh, right. all things like that. But thanks yeah. very much, Jennifer. Great to see you again. Always a pleasure, Jeff. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> all right, we appreciate it.